Uh, thank you so much, Thomas, for coming in. Sil silhouette. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Thomas, for coming to our class and to share with us wonderful stuff. And uh, are you thank back you home Richard already? For me. Mm -hmm. Are you yes. back home already? Okay. This is the bedroom that I. Yes, yes. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, great. This is the bedroom that I grew up in. I'm not <laughs> going to show you the bed, so I'm going to tilt it upwards. <laughs> so I've been in this bedroom since I was a teenager and I'm back here now. Uh, okay, so um, some of you are my friends, so uh, you probably already know how this happened. So I grew up in, I was born and I was raised in Singapore, like like most of the students, I would, I would presume. Um, and about 20 years ago, I left. Uh, at the time, it was just... Uh, me getting infatuated with traveling around the world, but I was poor, poor as in like a regular young person, poor, right? So like young, young and no money. <laughs> and so I, um, in case you don't know, like Singapore is a very small place and we have around 5 million people now, back then maybe three and a half. We're talking about 20 years ago. And back then the, uh, the theater industry or the theater community and the film, com the film community definitely didn't exist back then, but maybe a little bit of theater community back then. And all I wanted to do at that time was, uh, I was majoring in finance in, in Singapore, which is the right thing to do back then and probably even more now. So before my time, I heard it was engineering and then it became finance. Like the, the, the majors that you go in to that nobody would say you're doing the wrong thing. And I did that because I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And then, um, so then I chanced upon an opportunity to do something interesting, which was to perform in a theater show, and I did. So then that's how I got into the theater practice, which is one of the theater companies here, uh, which was quite prominent back then and maybe still quite prominent now. Now there's, I think, a lot more theater groups around, and that's how it all started. <clears throat> and um, after doing it for about a year or two, I finished my finance, my, my universities, my college studies, and I, did, I was um, sort of at a crossroads that I didn't know I was at because I was just maybe just too young and too naive to really know what was going on. Um, and, you know, speaking of the magic of uh, movies, right? So back then, I remember in this room that I'm in right now, back then it was DVDs, right? And um, Titanic had just finished about two years before then. And Leonardo DiCaprio was in this movie. And this is something new that I've never talked about before. Leonardo DiCaprio was in this movie called The Beach that Danny Boyle directed. And I didn't know who there were any, but everyone knew Leonardo DiCaprio by then because he was such a young and hot actor, right? So I, 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 I watched the, the film in this room. And the first half of the film was about an American backpacker going to Thailand and experiencing a lot of adventure. And then the second half was like how the tragedy unfolded and all that. But I was so fasc uh, fascinated by him taking this backpacking trip to Thailand that I decided that that was what I was going to do. And so I did that. And that was the first time I traveled out of Singapore. And I think that was the first step that, that changed my world. So for the first time I was, at the time it was before the time of smartphones for sure. So I relied on travel guidebooks to get me around and uh, to find like really cheap hostels to stay in. And I was kind of scared because back then when I was younger, I really believed in ghosts and I was kind of scared of ghosts. So I remember the, the first time when I was um, staying in this backpackers hostel in Bangkok, I was kind of scared that the, the, the room was haunted, right? But I didn't, but what can I do? I, I, mean, I cannot tell anybody. And I remember like maybe losing sleep the first night because I was kind of scared that the room was haunted. So I've come a long way from being scared that of haunted rooms and uh, um, I think after that trip, that's what I in my life and uh, probably made me really like traveling a lot. And I took this really long trip from Singapore to uh, Japan. So Singapore is connected geographically overland. We can go, I, I, and I went overland from Singapore through three or four countries to China and then I went through 16 provinces in China to the northeast part of China, I took a ferry to Japan. The whole trip lasted me six months and I, uh, that changed my, my, my world even more. <laughs> okay, so, 
so that had me uh after that i went to england to study to 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 see to i got a scholarship from a college in england and i went there to read theater to study theater for a year and from then from there i went to china for four years after that to Mac up to macau and, and hong kong where i became a filmmaker and then i came back to singapore to live here for a year and a half from 2010 to 2011 and i went to japan tokyo tokyo japan for four years and now la for five years so that start that and i, I didn't i didn't see it this way until one time i was in thailand with a friend and he's a thai guy he's a filmmaker and, and i told him this story about the beach about how it how it triggered me, how it kickstarted this whole journey. And he says, that's the, that's the magic of movies. And oh, wow, <laughs> right, maybe it is. I never saw it that way back then. I only made two films, feature films. I made three short films in between that nobody saw because I just didn't have, to be honest, I just didn't have money to send those short films out to film festivals. Hmm. Um, because sending films out to film festivals actually costs a lot of money. Like you send, normally it will be around, I think it's around 40 to $50. Mm. That, was that, uh, that was the time that, that was a time where we did not have like a Google Drive. <laughs> like, even box. if you had, the submission fee is still like around oh, 40 to $50. Yeah. And then for a feature film, probably a little bit more. And for the bigger festivals, like, like it's been a long time since I sent a film, but like a Cannes Film Festival probably for a feature film is like $200 or something. And that's a lot of money. Like mm -hmm. for, and that's just one festival. If you, if you, if you spend $40 on sending one, one short film to one festival, you send to 10 and it's $400. Mm -hmm. And then you get rejected by all of them, which is very normal. And then you wonder where this $400 went. I'll tell you mm -hmm. where this $400 went. This $400 went you and thousands and thousands of others that put in this $400 went into getting Leonardo DiCaprio to walk on the red carpet at the Berlin Film Festival and putting him up at great hotels. That's where it went. Mm. That's the truth. Yeah. But unfortunately for filmmakers, when you start out, that's the only way. Because like, if you talk about film festivals, like you send something to a film festival and the film festival gets thousands, if not tens of thousands of submissions. Like the Sundance Film Festival this year, I think they got, they received 14,500 submissions, mm. shorts and features. And they selected 112 for uh, screening mm. and 14 or 16 for competition. 14 out of 14,500 submissions, the possibility of you getting selected for competition is close to, is, is zero. Mm. Right? Last year when I did a simple calculation for my friend who got his film into competition, the, the chances is like 0 0.409%. So it's mm. as close to zero as you can get. So I'm saying that the, um, to me, the key to success is always access to opportunity. Yeah. And I think there's a misconception going around, where, especially at least when I was uh, young and starting out in Singapore, that is about talent. Talent is very important, but if you don't have opportunity, nobody in the world will know your talent mm -hmm. because then there's no, 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 no place to showcase your talent. And then I've also heard, like when, especially when you and I, Richard, were in the theater company, I, and I, I, I usually think of these people right now, like someone was telling me, I wouldn't say who, that she could play the lead role too. Mm. And at the time I was just 20 years old, right? I was like, oh yeah, it's true that like, you could play the lead role too. But then now that, and up, now, now that I think about it, yeah, maybe you can play the lead role too. Like maybe a hundred others can play or 10 others can play the lead role. But why didn't you? So there's a lot of other things that play that led to the lead actress land the lead role and not you. Because it's not about talent, because you are talking about just talent and acting skills that you could play the lead role to. In that case, then every role can be played by at least tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of, this, of people in the world, right? Mm. And then why did that one person land that role? So there's a lot of other things that play that led to the one person to become the actress for the role or the actor yeah. for the role. So first of all, I'm not from a film family. Like none of my friends growing up were involved in film or are involved in film now. So they are this still is the, the best closest part, friends you know? in my life. Like they, I, I, I grew up, like I have a, I have a group of really close um, primary or elementary school and high school friends here. And when I was in quarantine the past 14 days in, in the hotel, like they kept sending food to me because they were, they were like my family and none of them were in film. And they still are not. 
<clears throat> and um, I didn't come from a film family. I, and I didn't even come from a film country. So I was kind of as far as you could get. Although my country was affluent, Singapore is an affluent country, but it is not invested in filmmaking. And only recently has it been a little bit more invested in the arts, I would say. So anyway, um, I just had to find my own opportunity and there was no one to, so to speak, show me the way. And I just have to keep searching. That's why my search was so long. Like I searched for a good 15 to 20 years before I landed my current opportunity, which is to, to head a film company, uh, the LA office of a film company in LA. Uh, uh, at the LA office of a Hong Kong film company in, mm. in Los Angeles. So um, to start yourself off uh, as a filmmaker, I would say look at the resources that you have around you and in terms of your friends, in terms of the places you're staying right now, the room you're in right now, or if you know someone that owns a shop or if you know someone that gives you access, go into a crocodile farm or whatever it is, and then look at the people who might be able to act for you and choose one of them. A committed person is better than someone who's talented and experienced and not committed. If you're, if you're starting to build a film from scratch with presumably no money, okay? So then a main actor is important, a main location. And in my case, I would get a cameraman as well because I don't like to hold the camera. Neither am I very interested in cameras. But if you are very good at, at, at operating cameras, maybe you can do it yourself. And then, uh, and then you're good, sort of good to go and have someone around all the time to sort of record sound on a separate device. And these days, your iPhone can even be your camera. And then you're good to go and you can edit the thing on your computer and then you have something. You have a short film or maybe you even have a feature film. It's definitely not going to be the best film you can ever make. Or, or, but you, you have to be proud of, the, of how you make that film and you have to use all your resources to the max and beyond to make that film and that's going to be the best film you can make at that time. Because you can always make a better film later on, two years later. And, and that's why people wait because people keep thinking that uh, somehow money will come, which now, now come to think of it, like, especially in the American environment, like people teach you that uh, the script is the most important thing, which I totally agree that it's the most important thing. But then if you write, a, but your goal is to make a film and not to just finish the script, right? Unless you are only a writer. So if you're going to write a script that you cannot shoot, where does it, where does it leave you? It leaves you hanging with the end of the script all the time, which is what happens to a lot of filmmakers. They spend 20 years writing four scripts that, that, that they never get to shoot and they have four scripts. And, and that's how they spend the last 20 years of their life. And they get discouraged and eventually they get depressed and probably they give up and they, they don't feel good about their lives or, or the path that they've taken. So you have to write a film. In my opinion, that's how I built my films. Like I knew I had no money. So I looked at the resources that I had around me in terms of people, in terms of location, and maybe some money and the community that supports you the most. It could probably be somewhere you're from, and in most of our cases, maybe somewhere like Singapore. And for my case, somehow it became a place like Macau. So the community really supported me. So then I built my film around it. And after, after trying my best, I have a film that a lot of film festivals all rejected, which becomes the norm for me. But then the few, then you will, you will get people that support you along the way and you will find other things as you're moving forward. If you're staying still there, then you'll never move forward. Back to the point that a lot of people think that a great script is, just, is a good start. A great script is definitely a good start. But if, you are, if, you, if the script requires you to, to get a $1 million, or let's say a $500,000 investment in order to make the film, then you have to know that $500,000 is enough for people to start businesses out there, right? Or maybe even more than one business. So which means then, what, how are you gonna get this money in the first place? I think if, if you have some leads and you have some idea of how you're gonna get the money, you definitely try. But then after trying for some time and you still don't get it, I think you should start in another way, in a different way. Otherwise, you get stuck for 10 years with the same script or with two scripts that you never get to make. 
you're gonna get discouraged. That's just that's just all of us, right? So you have to write a story that you can shoot. And then if you don't know how to do something like editing or like sound editing, especially when you're young, you can learn. You know, there's a ton of courses that you can take or you can watch YouTube or you can find someone who knows it. Somehow make that person sit down next to you. Well, how, how I learned, now I can, I can edit quite well, to be honest. Like I can, in terms of writing, directing, acting, and editing, I actually think editing is my best thing. But I never tell people that because I don't want people to look at me as an editor. But editing really helped me in a lot of other areas. That's how I edited my quarantine videos, right? Like I edited them in like 10 minutes a day. I didn't spend too much time. I didn't want to spend too much time doing those things because that's just for fun. And so, so editing is a, is a good skill to learn. How I learned editing was after I, after I finished shooting my first film, I was very naive about everything about my first film. So, so how, I, how I made my first film was I threw myself into the situation where I knew where I had to make a film Otherwise, I will walk, I will, I will be, I will, sh I would have shamed myself. So I threw myself into a situation where I, 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 I said, I said to myself that I'm going to be, I'm, I want to make a feature film because a feature films, um, the experience of making a feature film, I thought, and I, and now it's been proven to be true. It's going to be so difficult that I will never forget that experience. I'll feel like the film bullied me and I, I did feel it that way that at that time and I, and I will have to make us another film in order to over, to bully it back. So so that's that's the way I looked at it. But it turned out to it became a lot harder than of course it did. It became a lot harder than I than I expected it to be. But after shooting the film, I told my DP, my cameraman at the time, I said like I'm gonna finish editing it in, in a month. And he said, Oh then you're never gonna sleep. And I said no 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 I'm gonna show you. And I knew nothing about editing. So how I, how, I, how I started was I, I, I bought a MacBook computer. And then at the time there was this CD-ROM tutorials, right? It's like, a, it's like YouTube tutorials. So I watched those tutorials and I started to learn from scratch. And it was so slow. I didn't even know it was slow until luckily for me, a week after that, I got to know this British guy who was in Macau tagging along because his girlfriend was there as an exchange student and he had nothing to do. And he heard that, oh, I was going to edit this film. He says, I know Final Cut really well. Let me help you. I said, okay. And he sat down next to me. It was like a full-time job. So me and him sat down next to each other and I didn't pay him any money. I bought him all. And he, he was young and he needed money. He, he, want, he need money. Everyone needs money. But he was young and he was happy to just have all his meals and hang out with me and all that. And so he was teaching me how to do it. And I remember, and I didn't have enough, I was a new person at editing. I didn't have enough footage. I didn't have enough coverage of all these shots. So I decided that some of these shots, we're just gonna kind of let it run for quite some time. Like let, let, let the whole take, the whole take of the shot take over the scene. He didn't like that because he was an ed he was actually an editor, right? And he wanted to get the reverse show and all that. And we, there was a bit of tension when I was working with him, like in terms of he didn't want to do. We are hearing a buzzing sound. I suspect yes, that the buzzing I sound. I hear that too. I I I, I suspect is coming from your Bluetooth, uh, because maybe is there's that? a battery or connection or something along those lines. Should I disconnect it? Do you have? Let me take this off. Do you, Do you have a wire? Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yes, we can hear you. Is it better now? Yeah, it is. But can you hear us? Can you hear me or not? I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I think this is better. Okay. All right. Sorry. So I was thinking that I, I got this editor to be on my, to, to like teach me every single day, like how to edit. And he left after a month. But that month, I picked up all the shortcuts and I never forgot it. I never forget it until today. And that's how I learned editing. Had I gone through that CD-ROM tutorial or the YouTube tutorial, I think I would have, it would have taken me like a year before I can learn anything that he taught me in a, in, a, in a month. Because with someone next to you, you can ask them questions. You cannot ask the YouTube tutorials any questions, right? You cannot, and they cannot answer you any questions. So try to get someone who knows what you want to learn and, and just be around the person all the time. And very soon you can probably pick it up. But you also have to want to do it. I feel like a lot of people, uh, like so many people in America that I know that want to be writer directors and they only want to write and direct and they say they don't have a producer and they don't have this and they don't have that. 
if you don't have those things, then you, you, you better, you better go find, you better be the producer. You better be your own producer. Otherwise, how are you going to make the film? And there's this guy that, um, a good friend of mine, he, he, he got, uh, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again in case you have heard it before. Um, he won the student Oscar when he was in his early twenties. And so that was like a, a very early, uh, high achievement, right? In his life. And for the next 20 years, he kept writing scripts that, uh, that he couldn't shoot because he needed at least a million dollars to shoot each of these, every one of these uh, feature films. So he met me and at the time I was using an iPhone to shoot my second film and he was, I, I, I don't know if he was impressed or he was shocked in a bad way that how can you use an iPhone to shoot uh, your feature film? I said, because I have no resources, I have no money but it's time for me to shoot a new film because I have had, I've gone through four years of waiting, lots of false starts, which always happens in the film industry. And I, I should start shooting something before, before I fade out, you know, like before the, the, the rage that I have starts to, starts to simmer, which will be a big shame. And so he says he has this script and he's looking for a million dollars and he's uh, pitching here and there and everything. Three months down the road, I've finished shooting the, my film and I've started the editing and I met him again. And he said, well, he's still trying to change the script and all that. And by then he, he had been with that script for like two years already. And I told him that you have to change the script to, to, to a place where you can shoot it with your existing resources. Otherwise, this is going to go on forever. And he, 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 he told me like that no matter how he tried, like he couldn't get it down to like 50,000 or whatever, or 500 or 100,000, or however much money he has. And I told him that you, you have to get it down. You're a creative, right? So you have to get it to a level where you can shoot it because your goal is to make the film and not to just finish the script. And you have to get it to the level where you can shoot, even if it doesn't match your existing vision. That's my opinion. Because I have a vision of how I want my films to be, but I don't need it to be my first film. It can be my fourth film, my fifth film. If I'm lucky enough to make that many films, I'm already a big success. So if the, I think the problem with him was he went to film school and film school taught him that the script has to be of a certain level, which is great. And then the, his vision, and also he won the student Oscar. I saw his uh, short film that won the student Oscar and it was, a, it was very, very good. Like the story was good, the shooting was good, everything was good. And maybe he was expecting that level to, um, to come back for his feature films. And he didn't have the access to the equipment that he had as a student anymore. That was the first thing as well. So he became really discouraged and in the end he became depressed. And I told him, and he, in, in terms of like, he actually saw a doctor for depression and he had, had to take depression pills and all that. And as a friend came one point, I told him, I think maybe you should quit. You know, like, you should be happy. You should be happy more than you should make this film anymore. So the point is, going back to, I'm, I'm, I'm going for too far off now. So the point, going back to the original point, you have to write a script as a filmmaker. You just look at the resources that you have, be a little bit ambitious than the resources that you have in front of you. Because when you start moving forward, you will find more resources. Mm -hmm. It may not be a lot more money, but more friends will appear to help you. Friends with different skills will come to help you. And people, people admire people who help themselves first. If you don't help yourself first, nobody will ever help you. Lower down the totem pole means that, okay, so, so the networking party, you can feel who's low and who's high on the totem pole. Okay. If you're an actor and nobody knows you, yeah. and you tell, and networking parties are such that you buy a glass of wine or a glass or a glass of beer or whatever and you walk around the room and everybody's doing the same and you start chatting with people yep and the actors when people hear that oh this guy this person is an actor they will try their best to leave the conversation as quickly as they can right this this is the truth okay i'm not judging but this is just the truth but if you're a financier you're the highest on the totem pole right everybody wants to be around you then your the crowd around you just kind of grow and everybody's leaning in to listen to what you have to say and so that's how that's where you are on the totem pole so a lot of actors, like they will brand themselves as producers as well. And when they go to these kind of situations, they will call themselves producers. But then actors, when you start to get famous, 
you, you rise the totem pole like really fast. If you are a star actor, you're on top of the totem pole, right? Like at least Bradley Cooper is gonna green light the film, not the producer, not the investor, but Brad, the, yeah. Brad Pitt is green lighting the film. So, <laughs> so that's the that's the funny thing with actors. I don't. I I have I have never really thought about this branding thing, but I have people tell me that that I'm good at branding myself, and I just think it came from trial and error. Like for me, what happened was. I felt like the press started to really support me when I was working in Macau. Uh, and it was a bit of a um, coincidence. And, and actually now in hindsight, when I look back at it, when I was making my films in Macau, like nobody was making films. So making films is always... So the, the, the best thing about making films is filmmaking is a very exciting thing for everyone. For filmmakers and for laymen, it is super exciting. When you, when you tell your normal friends that you're making a film, they are, they, are, they are very excited about it. So everyone wants to get a piece of the filmmaking world in a small way or in a big way. That's why investors invest in films. Every investor knows that filmmaking is the surest way to lose money. But it's also the most exciting thing in the world. And if they have money to spare, why not give it to you and be a producer on a film that stars Brad Pitt? And all they did was put in money and they become executive producer. And then the film can make money back for them. So in terms of uh, the Macau community started to really support me, starting with the press. And also now that I look at the Macau community, I can see that they are very clicky. So they, they separate themselves into groups. There's the Macau Chinese, there's the Macau Portuguese, there's the mainland Chinese, there's the foreign workers in terms of the Filipinos and also the Americans that work in the casino there. I do not fall into any of those groups per se. And fortunately for me, I can speak most of their languages. So I was able to weave myself in and out of all these groups just by being there. And it's a very small place, very dense. And I think that really helped. Mm. So they have three major languages, which is Chinese, Portuguese, and English. English is unofficial, but English is always a major language in these kind of places. Chinese and Portuguese are official languages. Yeah. So they have a lot of press with, that covers all these three languages. Yeah. And being there for a while, it very quickly made me... So I made myself available to all these different communities and then they quickly became my friends and they, they started to cover my work. And the more people cover your work, the more people will... The, the, more, there will, the more people cover your work, it will invite even more people to cover your work. It's like film festivals too. So once they start supporting this filmmaker, they will try their best to continue to support this filmmaker. If your short film got into cans, there's a very high chance that your feature film will too. And for me, what happened was, I didn't have, I didn't make short films before I made my feature film. And I had a really hard time with festivals when I started with my feature film. Hmm. I would say, you know, like go to, to go to the place that supports you. Like it's not about big or small, like for maybe for like, because I, when, I, when I look at the, the, the people in America and they, they go back to their hometowns, you know, to make their first film because their hometown supports them. Mm -hmm. And also the stories that they are most apt to tell are the stories from their hometown. Mm -hmm. And so because back in their hometown, wherever they're from, maybe it's a small town or whatever, like these people are more excited about you making a film as compared to the people in LA. People in LA, like, well, well, everyone's making a film. So if you go back to your hometown where nobody makes, it's like me going to Macau. Macau is not my hometown, but then like going to a place where people are excited about you doing work there and your dollar will go a much longer way. Mm. I see a lot of young people these days, they come with a sense of entitlement and that's the number one thing that will uh, that will stop you from making a film. That will stop you from having a career. Like we have had, like Ivona works with me in, in Sun LA and we've had people pitch to us and there was this particular instance where this person was pitching to us and telling us that uh, she needs $1.5 million to make her film and mm. she has a bag and everything. And then she has no money right now and I asked her like, so if you, and young, right? Like very, like 25, 26, I say like, if you have no money at all, are you still going to make this film? And I forget the details, but the feeling she gave me was like, if I don't have at least half a million, I'm not going to make this film. And it's the way that it was put across. Like it's, it was like with a sense of self and like a, a, a sense of 
entitlement. And I just felt like it's the filmmaker's duty to make the film, not anybody else's, not the investors. So first of all, you're unproven. So nobody's going to give you a million dollars or even 10,000 or maybe 10,000, maybe yes, but maybe a hundred thousand. Nobody's going to give you a hundred thousand dollars to make anything if you are unproven, right? Because even if I had a million and I wanted to give it to you, 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 you are unable to, to convince me that you can use this million dollars to make the film. You might just waste it all, right? Doing, making all the wrong moves and never get a film out in, at the end of the day. So your, your best chance when you're unproven and you have no money is to make the other side feel that you're going to make this film no matter what. Like even if you, even if at any cost, you're going to make this film, even if it costs you your life, you're going to make this film. And when the other side feels this thing, they are going to feel your passion, right? They are going to help you in some way. And I always be appreciative when anybody gives you any form of help. And if they still don't, but then they're impressed with you and they remember you, to have, the other, to have someone with resources remember you is hard enough. Because people with resources are approached all the time by hundreds and thousands of different kinds of people with different kinds of proposals. And the only way to impress them is with, is with your energy, with the rage. That's why I say that when people are young and yeah, they want to make films, it is, it is a rage. You know, it's not only about passion. It's about... A passion is... This word passion is definitely overrated. Like passion to me means nothing. Like I'm, I can speak passionately right now. If I don't do anything tomorrow and I don't do anything moving forward, I have nothing. Mm. And the next time you see me again, I still speak with the same passion. It doesn't mean anything. So tenacity is, is, the, way, is the way to get films made. And after some time, after years, like people are going to know if you ever like, take action to do your thing or not. And if you do, then more and more people come on board. Okay. Help you. Yeah. Okay. I I think this is uh, this seems to be a very good time for us uh, because you have spoken more like I think for forty minutes. So maybe it's a good time uh, for us to maybe uh, uh, check in with the rest of you there. Uh, all right. Um, so we our 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 conversation kind of ended in that sense that young people are kind of uh, uh, maybe entitled, which I I I'm still thinking about it because I I teach young people. You know. Uh, and I do not think that uh, some of them are, uh, most of them are entitled, uh, they feel their entitlement. In fact, they are more bewildered <laughs> in, uh, with, with the current situation that we are in. So, um, yeah, do you have uh, anything, you know, any, any, anyone uh, you can share with us? Uh, what, uh, 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 is there anything that you want to share with us after you've heard uh, Thomas saying, for a long time and also for the benefit of my students uh, could you kindly mo also maybe do a little bit of a short introduction of yourself like your profession uh, what you do so that uh, they also get a chance to maybe like you know network uh, with all of you uh, yeah. <laughs> so so that you know when they go out in the, uh, in the industry if they see you they'll be able to go like oh hi i think we met virtually right yeah anyone You can unmute yourself. <laughs> Only you can unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. You, you can <laughs> uh, 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 any time, right? And, and also for my students, uh, don't be shy. Feel free to uh, express your views. Huh? Yeah. So uh, what do you think of whatever that Thomas said earlier? The, the, the problem with filmmaking is because it costs a lot of money and this amount of money is not the amount of money, it's not an amount that a single person can easily fork out. At least I cannot, right? And therefore, you will need to get investors on board, mm. right? be it the film commission or be it private investors. And when private investors come on board to give you a big amount of money, there are always conditions attached, right? They... Not just in Singapore, everywhere in the world, if you, if you approach a, an investor who comes in with a big amount of money, they, they are going to want to tell you what to do. Unless you are already established and they really trust your vision and then they might let you do what you want to do. So this is very normal. But then if you want to make a film, like you say, for yourself, then where, did you, where do you get the money to make the film? Unless, if you have the money, like if you're a very rich person and you, you can do anything you like in the world, you can make any film you like in the world. But then I would also say that the film only exists in the eyes of your audience. So if, if, if you make a film and, and, and no audience see it, then your film doesn't, doesn't exist, to be honest. One of the best advice I've ever gotten, it was actually from a person in Singapore, 
International Film Festival, a great friend of mine who doesn't work there anymore. I've known him since I was 18 years old. And when I was making my first film, he knows me very well. And I even acted in my first film. So he, he saw several different, because we are friends, I showed him several different cuts of the film. And one day he came to me with this piece of advice that I'll never forget. He says, the, 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 your film is a small part of this situation of you making a film. So the content of your film, what the story is about and all that, is a very small part of this whole picture of you, Thomas, trying to make a film. The bigger part is how do you reach, how do you put, how do you uh, reach out to an audience and let them see your film? To me, every stage of filmmaking is difficult. The hardest part to me is how do you get an audience? Because that's the part that involves money, involves a lot of different people coming in to help you out. You can, like, I feel like I have a lot of different skills, at least on the basic level, fundamental level, to build a film other than sound editing and music composition. I can do everything myself, so to speak, but it shouldn't be that way. So filmmaking is always about, I will, try to, I will always try to avoid editing my own films because my eyes are the least fresh. I need a fresh pair of eyes to look at my footage to, to edit the best, the best film moving forward because my audience will always be a fresh pair of eyes. Yeah. Right? So... I need collaborators and collaborators when they come in and, and there are different fireworks that can happen that is, that, is, that is great for filmmaking. But then back to the original point, the distribution part is always the hardest part because it involves the most amount of money in terms of marketing and publicity. Look at all these films on Netflix. You turn on Netflix, there's thousands of films, right? Like how are you going to get people to watch yours? And how are you going to get to Netflix in the first place? Right? If you, if you put your film out on YouTube, your friends and your family, your friends and family don't count, you know? Your friends and your family will always support you. That's what they're there for. You don't have to be making a film. You can be selling chicken rice, they will also be supporting you. So that doesn't really count in terms of advancing your film career. So that, to me, friends and family is great. Like, they, they support you, that's fantastic. But it's not only about them. If you want to make this a career, if you want to make this your hobby, by all means, friends and family is more than enough. You can... Um, you can screen it at your house party or wedding party or whatever, and that's, that's going to be that. But in terms of the film career, you need a solid uh, investor to come in with. I would say if you're a filmmaker, pair up with a good producer. Pair up with a producer who knows these things that you don't know or you're unwilling to know or there's some part of you that feel like I'm betraying the creative instincts in me if I think about business. If you think that way, then you have to pair up with a good producer. But I would always say like a good director always have half his mind on the business side. And the more he does it, the more he knows how to balance this thing. He knows what his target market is and how to deal with it. My, Amer my, 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 my office in LA has an American partner. They know themselves very well. They are not thinking about anything but the American market. And today they are not thinking about anything but comedies and thrillers because that's what streamers want. So they narrow it down and this is what we are going to do. And then they are going to think, the first thing when they see like a, like a project pitch to them, the first thing they're going to think about is, can this project make money? And then if it can, they, are, they still care very much whether or not the story is good, it's a message I want to tell, but that can come later to them. Because they know that if they start making films that don't make money, they will close shop really soon. So it's economies of skills as well sometimes. Like some big production company, they make 10 films that our Hong Kong partner. So Hong Kong, my head office is Hong Kong, but we also have a Hong Kong partner. They own Yip Man. So they make one Yip Man and 10 other films in the same year that all fail. And I don't even know the names of the film. But that one film is going to make all the money back. It's just the same way the American studios do. They, they, can, they make one Avengers and they can make 99 other crappy films that don't make any money and then they're gonna make all the money back too. But then if you only have, if you're a, a small production company in, in, in wherever it is and you make only one film a year, then you're in a very dangerous spot because that film is most likely gonna lose money. And then if you do it too many times, you're gonna close shop. So, yeah. so they know this and they have to survive. So from their angle, I think it is, it is reasonable for them to think about these different things. 
So even if you are, you are even if you are their childhood buddy, or unless you save them from drowning in their in their last life, then they have to repay you back this debt. Otherwise, you know, like they're gonna think about these things, and it's only fair for them too, because money is hard to earn, like for them too. Yeah, and so, people with people with money, they're actually even more careful about money. Mm. They can give you a large amount of money, but they they will actually be more more sharp about whether or not they can make the money back for them. It's, it's, they're businessmen. Every step along the way, I would, I would always say, and at least I say it to myself, every step along the way, you have to give it your very best. Because first of all, you don't want to represent yourself any less than your best. Why would you want to do half-hearted? If you, if you, if you give half-hearted effort, you, you, you will get half-hearted results at best. Because people are giving their very best and not getting the results they want. Why, why would you get any result if you're not giving your very best? So... So first of all, you have to give your very best. When you're 20s, be willing to live for less. You know, like when you're in your 20s, you're young, you have, a, you have a lot of time ahead of you. Like try different things, do different things because I don't think you're formed yet. I think in your, in your 20s, your characters are not formed yet. That's my personal opinion. In your, before you're 20, you're instilled values in life. Like be polite, be respectful, be fair, be honest. These are values that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Once between 20 and 30, you're forming your characters. So your characters are not formed yet in your 20s. The best thing you can do yourself for yourself in your 20s is if you can find a mentor, that will be the very that will be the absolute best. So like the Hong Kong industry grew from and prospered back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s from mentorship culture. They still have their very strong mentorship culture now, but then their market is too small now. So back then nobody went to film school. Everybody's a high school dropout for them. And they went into the industry just by coincidence, by people pulling them in and whatever. And they got good mentorship and they become the biggest figures of Chinese cinemas today. So if you have, if you can find a mentor in your twenties, that'll be the absolute best thing that you can do for yourself in terms of your career. And if you have any money in your twenties, especially in your early twenties, if you have any money, do traveling, go travel, go travel around the world. Singapore is a very small place. Go travel around the world. These experiences that you gather on your travels will only grow in value as you get older. Everything else that you buy with your money, your iPhone, you like it less and less with each passing day. You can buy a Ferrari today. Next month, you may not drive it anymore. But then your travel memories will, and your experiences, will, especially experiences with people, it will grow in value as you get older and older. So this, is, this has value when you're in your 20s. And especially when you're in your 20s, you're young, you're adventurous, you're more curious in your 20s for sure. And one thing that very few people, because I travel, I, I, I went to 30 countries as a backpacker before I turned 30. And I feel very strongly about this. There's one thing that people seldom talk about, about traveling early, which is you can eat anything you like and you're not going to die. Because when you go out there, you may not know what you end up eating. Because you don't know the language, you don't know the food, you're pointing to whatever the guy sitting next table is eating and you're going you're gonna to eat that. And then even, even if it doesn't sit well with you, half a day, one day, you're good to go the next day. Today, if I eat those same stuff that gave me a stomach back then, it might make me, take me two weeks to recover, you know, like it's, it's different. So that is also because your body is very strong and your whatever immune system, whatever. And your sense of curiosity, and if you do it alone, you're going to meet different people. Always go... Value people with a different point of view because they, they came from a different place and they're going to teach you a, a different way of looking at things. And then you will slowly, gradually get to know yourself better and better, form your character, and then also know like, what you really like and don't like. It's good that you find your passion early in your life. You know? like many people never even find it. And then many people never find what they like to do their whole lives. Like they're in their 40s, they're in their 50s, and they say, the first thing is, I don't even know what I want to do. So then, then I don't know what to say. So when, you're, when you can find that early in your life, that's, that's step one. The next thing is whether or not you're good at it. That's a different thing than whether or not you like it. And if you, if you, if you do what you're good at, good things are going to come to you in life. If you find out what you're good at doing and then you continue to do that, it's going to attract all the other good things to your life. It's going to attract the money that you need. It's going to attract the balance, the respect people give you. It's going to attract maybe status, maybe whatever else that comes with that. that. And, I, and I learned this from watching one of my friends. And she was, she's a very short girl and she, she's from Hong Kong. And she, very early on in her very early 20s, she wanted to be an actress. And very quickly, she found out that she's not, she's not very good at it. She admitted it to, to herself. And so then she, she really loved the performing arts field and she didn't want to venture too far from it. So she became an, a manager for artists or an arts manager. And she's really good at that. 
And then today, she's around the same age as me. So she's around 40 years old. She has all the good things in life. People respect her. People pay her money. Because once you're very good at what you do, you're going to get. And the environment helps as well. The environment is extremely important. Go to the environment that I have been searching. I had been searching for the environment that's most suitable for me by just trial and error. Nobody showed me the way. But people always trigger something for me to go. Like a friend triggered me going to America because he had the same similar credentials as me and he showed and he got his green card and he just kind of showed me that hey you can get it too and mm. that was the trigger and he today he no longer lives there and I'm mm. there so people open doors windows of opportunity like they open like this is not opportunity but then like people trigger things people open doors and people may not hold your hand to go to 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 pull you through the door and it's really up to you whether or not you want to go through the door. Some small, small opportunities excite you all the time. Oh this project comes around oh it's quite exciting, I do it. Maybe for three months, I'm quite excited or less. Mm. But the major life-changing opportunities, there are very few in life. You'll be lucky to meet just very few. Once you miss them, they'll never come back. Okay. And sometimes sometimes you, age-wise, you're not ready. In terms of maturity, you're not ready. And sometimes it is a shame. And maybe Ivana, where I like, cannot see your face because uh, uh, your camera is too high up. That's so fine. I want to you know, push it a bit lower. Yeah, come. So yeah, Ivana, is, Ivana, Ivana works with me at the Sun LA office. Okay. I started September the 1st. She started September the 18th. Okay, She's cool. been with me like the past two years. Kat is a producer friend of mine in America. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Catherine, you have something to say? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to say a few words. Hey, guys. Hey. Yes. Um, good morning, I think it, it, it is in Singapore, right? Is, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's afternoon in uh, Singapore, but but you're oh, in yeah, US, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. quite late. Huh? Thank you so much for yeah, no staying problem, up. no problem. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thomas, for inviting me. Richard, thanks for having me. Um, I think uh, so. The way I got in, just long story, very short, um, is I had a regular nine to five job. I'd always wanted to be in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I think it was through a Facebook group um, for the local area that I was in. I tried finding other uh, local filmmakers mm -hmm. and um, that were just trying to put something together. And I connected with them and we just started having like these meetings, sharing different story ideas. And then we went out and I don't actually, to be completely honest with you, I don't remember how they got the equipment but it was a free job it was um something i did on the weekend mm -hmm. and i used to just go with the same group every weekend we would do something film mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. um and then it was actually just i had done that i think four or five times was all it took and then the fifth time i made a connection with somebody who um, I worked with him for four hours and then he was just like, he hit me up like the day after and was like, I really liked you. I, I saw that you were a hard worker, um, which is a huge thing is just putting in a little effort and you can separate yourself from a lot of other people. Mm. Um, Cause I really wasn't doing any, I was still learning, but I was eager to learn. And that's another thing too, is people can read that energy coming off of you. Mm -hmm. um, but he offered me a job that was paid and it was, it ended up being like a little web series. Um, I think it's actually, now it's out on DVD. So they made distribution and all that, but um, it was for a sis sister company of Paramount. So I was like, oh, this is like a real, or I'm sorry, Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is like a real gig. Yeah. So that was the first job. It was just a small job. It was only going to film for maybe a month, I think. It wasn't, it, no, 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 not even a month. It was, it was less than that. It was probably a few weeks, three weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the decision. That was the defining moment in my life for the, my career where I took a leap of faith and I decided to quit my nine to five mm. and did the job, you know, and that's you when you gotta just, yeah, I'm sorry. Were you worried that you had to give up your job to do this? Um, yeah. So yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, but I had, 
the thing was, is I had some savings. Um, I knew I could keep myself afloat for at least like a couple of months if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing too to consider is you can always go out and get, you can always make it happen if you want to, right? So like you can go out and get a serving job or whatever to make ends meet if you need to. Um, I ended up being okay because the film industry is very word of mouth. So if you're a hard worker, people care more about if they can work with you for 12 hours at a time than they do because you can, you can learn anything. Anybody can be taught anything in the industry. I think, um, well, except for acting, uh, Don, you know, like I, you know, I can't claim to be an actor and I can't like, even if I went to acting school, I don't think I would make it out <laughs> alive in that. So there's, there is like skill and talent required. Right. But, but at least on the production side, just to get on a professional film set, you really don't need any specific skills per se. You just need to have, you just need to be willing to learn and observe and work hard and people mm -hmm. will want to keep working with you. And then mm -hmm. people will want to train you and mm -hmm. teach you. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my, that was my experience. And then mm -hmm. it just snowballed. It was, uh, the, my bosses liked me and then they brought me on to another project right after that one ended. Mm -hmm. So more money came in. Um, and then actually the third project I ever worked on professionally is the one that I met Thomas on. Mm. Um, and then it just really kept going. I mean, you have dry patches um, of no work, <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, that, that just happens, but you gotta, that's why you have to be smart when you are making money in the industry. You gotta mm. learn to save some mm. of that and be financially responsible. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think my biggest thing is, yes, you have to get out and just do it. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable and confident enough to just do it yourself, find others. Yeah, and when, just, when, like, when find somebody else and connect. When you try to, when uh, I can see that you take a lot of initiative, right? And you yeah. are really driven, and you want to do uh, things that you want to do. Uh, are there times where you feel very tired? Like you know, why oh, yeah. you start to question, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? Oh yeah, that happens then, often. Yeah, then, 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 yeah. then, 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 how do you kind of? I don't know. Talk yourself out or what? This is what I hear right. from my students. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Um, I was gonna say like persistence is like the key word of the industry. You gotta just keep going. Um, I would say it definitely helps to know that you're not alone there's a lot of like, we're all experiencing it. If you start making those connections and other friends, it doesn't need to even be like professional. Like if mm -hmm. you're just making, if you just if fellow students, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know that other people are in the same situation, like, cause it is easy to get discouraged. And like, even once you get your foot in the door and you're working professionally, mm -hmm. you do have times when you're not working and then you're like, Ugh, <laughs> am yeah. I ever going to work again? Yeah. And, um, but, but then, you know, it always comes back. You yeah. gotta just, you really gotta trust yourself. I think, um, you gotta like have faith that it's going to, that it's just going to work out. If it's something that you really want, it will. It really will. It will yeah. be okay. <laughs> like, and you know what, if, if in the meantime, if it's a financial situation, I mean, you can, you can always get money. Mm. You can always find ways to get money. That's, mm. that's like the smallest obstacle. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, but staying positive really is at the core of that is just having faith in yourself yeah and mm -hmm. like knowing that you know you're not alone there's other people in the same situation yeah. like mm -hmm. professionals that do this all the time still have moments like that um but yeah I, I think it's just you gotta once you really decide that this is what you want to do hold on to that and like don't let it go yeah the key thing is to decide you know you really have to decide on what you want yeah yep yep you really do and like it might be a weird path to get there. Um, it's not always a straight line. You know, you might have to take a little detour for a few years. Like it took me, I've 
since I can remember, I've always wanted to be in the film industry, but yet I, it took me until I was, uh, how old am I now? It took me until I was like 26 before I got, mm. I had a whole other career before the film industry. Okay. I was in marketing and all that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you got to just follow your path, your journey. Yeah. You really got to just stick with. Have a sense of clarity. Yeah? Have, a, have yeah. a sense of clarity. You know, uh, it's so difficult. I only got my sense of clarity when I turned 40. Yeah? And I'm 47 already, so ah, it's a bit late, but it's okay. No, no, it's never late. It's never too late. <laughs> it really isn't. It's never too late. Like, yeah. like I, I met I met Kat maybe around four years ago in a production mm-hmm. in Utah, and I remember her the most, the best, because she was always very curious, and she was very, she was very enthusiastic about everything, and that really left a, a deep impression on me. And when she moved to LA, like I just wanted to. To, 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 to hang out to hang out with her a lot because mm-hmm. it's very positive vibe and people yeah. like this kind of thing yeah and also I would say like which I which is something that I tell Kat a lot that the way the surest way to succeed is if you surround yourself with successful people mm. the five people that's the closest to you will determine your future from the day you were born you are trying to imitate the closest five people in your life mm-hmm. And people, when it comes to great opportunities, like small opportunities people give to whoever is in front, is standing right in front of them. Mm-hmm. When it comes to really good opportunities, it's always a personal decision. They always give it to the people they like. And they always give it to the people that they want to help succeed. And that's why family would give it to family. That's why husbands, would like, the husbands and wives will succeed together. And that's why they give it to their children great opportunities. Because... Talented people and people who have the skills to do that job are many. So who ends up getting these opportunities are these relationships. And it's not, a, it's not in a bad way at all because humans are about relationships all the time. So, yeah, Kat. Oh, no. Yeah. So I would just also say, interject in there, mm-hmm. um, that it's also like speaking of connections. Oh, wait, what was I going to say? <laughs> um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. It was so good too. All right, Thomas, I'll just let you keep talking, then I might just interrupt. Okay. So, so, so that's what it is, and then also I also feel strongly that you should, as soon as possible, be clear about the goal. So, about Richard saying clarity of goal, I think clarity of goal is very important. Don't be vague about it, and then think about what your next step is, which is something I tell Ivana all the time. You have to know what your next step is that will get close that you get you closer to once you know the goal in a clear way, then it stays there. You don't have to be overwhelmed with it. Because sometimes the goal is very big. And if you think about it every single day, you'll get so overwhelmed that there's no energy to do productive stuff anymore. Mm. So then the next thing to do is think about what the next step is. Mm. Because it's only with a next step that tomorrow will be different than today that you inch closer to your goal. If you don't know the next step and you're just thinking about the goal all the time then you never get to the mountaintop because tomorrow is going to be the same as today. Mm-hmm. So once, and it's, it doesn't happen overnight. So when you, when you try to do that more and more, it becomes more and more natural for you to know what the next step is. And maybe the next step is a wrong step, but you'll find out after you take it. Mm-hmm. And also there's no problems in the future. Kat, you're going to say something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, coming back, it's coming to, back. You can finish that, yeah, you can finish that thought if you want. Okay. Um, I think also too, just coming with the perspective of wanting to help others Mm -hmm. as well. Like when you hop on set, like have the attitude of like, I'm here to help you make your production um, be meaningful. You know, it it helps a lot if you come from like, not like a selfish place and you want to, you genuinely want to just help and see what you can do. I think so, so, so back to my goal thing. So once you know the goal, you might be scared, you might be terrified of some problems that you anticipate in the future. Mm-hmm. And one of the best things that I've ever heard was that there's no problems in the future other than serious problems. There's problems with everybody like terminal illnesses and all that, that nobody can deny is a problem. Other than those, all problems are a reflection of your own opinion of it today. And our opinion and our feelings towards everything changes all the time. 
So if you anticipate like a problem is there 20 years down the road, once you get there, I guarantee you 100%, you are feeling different about that thing than you are today. And maybe when you get there, there's no, there's no longer a problem. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's no problems waiting for you in the future other than death. But before you get to death, you have to get your goal accomplished. And you have to want to do it at any cost. Because filmmaking is a really difficult thing. If you just do it because you, because you, have, you just do it sometimes, then you, you, you'll never get there. Mm. Okay, out of curiosity, Ivana, so what's up next? <laughs> Ivana's going to sleep in two hours. Oh, really? Ivana, are you okay? <laughs> uh, our friends in America, if you're really tired, huh? and, and, and you I never, never take it her after you know. midnight in LA. <laughs> Hi. Hello, hello. Hi. So Ivana is an uh, Asian American. She was born in Sacramento in California mm. and she started working with me two years ago. Okay. And I bring her to all my meetings and she knows everybody I know, maybe even more because some of the meetings I don't go and she goes. <laughs> and so, so she's the best person to go to uh, if, uh, if you have a question about LA than me. My students, this is the next generation producer. So please listen to her now. Um, I th- I think I'll talk about how I got into the industry okay. too. So, interesting enough, um, Singapore was what inspired me to pursue entertainment because I actually really wanted to do entertainment. But growing up in an Asian family, they're like, "Oh, do business, do uh, engineer, doing your typical thing." And I was like, "Okay, I'll do the business route." So I took business, and then I studied abroad my second year at NUS. And then when I was at NUS, I found a bunch of Singaporeans that were really, they knew exactly what they wanted to do, whether it was like going to finance or going to like mm-hmm. whatever industry. And I was like, wow. I mm-hmm. was, at that time, I was like, I'm not going to intern. I'm not going to do anything because I want to enjoy life. But seeing how everyone was so, um, they knew what they were doing. So I decided that I'm going to be the same and I'm going to go do entertainment and I want to pursue it. Mm-hmm. But then I didn't have experience in entertainment. Um, I couldn't find a job in entertainment after I graduated. And I don't live in LA. I actually grew up in NorCal. So that means if I can find a means to support myself, I had to go back home to my family. So I was like, okay, so I'm just going to find any job, any job that can um, let me stay in LA. And then, um, so I did. And then for almost a year, I was working there while I was still trying to find an entertainment job. But for at least more than half a year, I couldn't find anything. So I realized, okay, um, this is not going to work. So maybe I'll go into internship and I'll do like free, I'll work for free at like sets or student sets, anything, like anything that could gain me experience. And um, at that time I was working full time and I had technically no time for anything else, right? Besides the weekend. And I told, um, I told my manager, I was like, I'm really passionate about entertainment. I really want to do it. And I still need um, money. I still need my job. Like, is it possible for me to do intern and also work here for at the same time? And at that time, my company had never had a part-time employee, but then they said, okay, I see your passion and I want to um, let you pursue what you want to do. So they agreed to let me work earlier and leave earlier. And I was working um, a little less hours, but still considered part-time. I'm not still considered full-time. Um, and then, so I would wake up like 6, 7 a.m., go work, and at 1, I would get off and go to my internship, which was like an hour and a half drive away because all the agencies are in Beverly Hills, Hollywood area. And then, so I was interning there for a while. And on the weekends, I would also um, go on sets, like some student sets or like free sets that I'll work as a PA just to meet people. And then eventually, I finally found my first job in entertainment after um, like seven months or so. And then... While I was there, I would continue to um, uh, like work on different sets. And one thing I really think is like, you never know who you're going to meet and if these people are going to help you in some way or another. So like on one of my sets, I met this girl. Um, she actually just came to the U.S., but she was, she did film in China for a while already. So, and she was coming to study. And then so we met on the set and then we became friends and she said like I see your passion in um, entertainment so like I'm doing this little media thing and do you want to help me? And it was completely free but she brought me around to meet different people and then on one of our 
filming things, I met this guy. Um, we just added WeChat. I never talked to him again. And then after a few months, when I was trying to find a new job, uh, I saw that he posted that he was looking for, he knew a producer who was looking for um, an assistant. And that was actually Thomas. So I hit that person up and was like, hey, um, uh, I heard you, uh, you have a friend who's looking for a job. And then like, can you introduce me? And then I didn't really know that person that well at, the same, at, the, at that time. But then I was like, okay, like might as well just try. And then eventually I met Thomas and then like, I guess he liked me enough. And then, so we started working together. So I think like the moral of the story is kind of, you never know um, who you're going to meet and just do anything you can, um, whether it's free or whether it takes more of your time or um, you're working 12 hours a day, just go for it. And then eventually you might find the right opportunity. So you see like last time, the last time when I was speaking at the Nian Poly Polytechnic Zoom, Owen asked me a question, although he didn't turn his video on at the time. But I remember yeah. him. See, Owen, you start so, first. So that's the interaction <laughs> that's needed. Like whenever you meet someone, like, yeah. like let me share very, very quickly, just one minute. Like when I, when I, when I, when I first went to LA, like I didn't have a visa, I didn't have green card, nothing. I, I had no permission to work. So what I did was I attended a night uh, summer class, by it's night class at UCLA about producing to learn the business of uh, Hollywood because the business of Hollywood is so different than than anywhere else. But when I was at the, uh, it was a three hour, three hour class every night. There was an intermission of 15 minutes in between. And growing up in Singapore, I never asked questions, especially my time. I never raised my hand to ask a question, never in my primary or secondary or university time. But during that class, I was asking questions all the time because I knew that was my opportunity for the lecturer. And those lecturers, they are people who are working in Hollywood. They are not like per se lecturers. They are work Hollywood practitioners. So I wanted them to remember me and I wanted to just interact with them. And during intermission, I would just go up to them and ask a question. And sometimes I don't even know what I was going to ask. And I asked when I was standing in front of them, but I thought about the question to ask. And I forced myself to do it because that was the only way because I didn't come so far all the way to Los Angeles to, to just be quiet and sit at the back anymore, right? So, so that's, that's, that I forced that, that change onto myself. You know, like, to be honest, like, I feel, especially when I went to LA, like, this industry is all about, like if you don't know the person to begin with, this industry is all about how can they make use of you? You know, like when I went to LA, especially, I was so not used to the, the, general, the general meeting culture, which is you just sit down with somebody to, for the first time and to talk about just anything that you want to talk about for about an hour. And the standard is about an hour. So, and sometimes people somehow have this clock ticking in their head that, once an hour is up, they say, okay, so next, see you next time or something like that. And it felt really, really weird for me coming from an Asian culture. But, that's, but now I've gotten used to it. And I've learned that they, they will only give you an opportunity if they can see something in you that they want to do. You, they want to use. Like they want, they, if, if they can see something in you that they can, they can make use of, that is of mm. value to them. But then unfortunately, a lot of people don't have much to give themselves and they expect that from other people. That's why these meetings never work. But then people with resources, even if they want to bring you in, they have to see something in you that you can help them do. Be it, you know, like you're just young and energetic and want to do anything. And, and then they would, you would do anything they, well, they ask you to do. Like no egos involved. Even that is of value, you know. And, that, and you have to come in with that attitude if you're young. If you're young, never give the impression that you're entitled in any way. Once an older person says that you have a sense of entitlement, then, because there are plenty of others who don't have that, who are willing to do anything, especially when they're young. So always come in with, so I don't know, I'm, I'm not answering your question because I don't know how to answer your question. If I was 20 years younger, maybe I can. You know, like one of the, one of the things I really learned, um, especially when I moved to LA, is that, mm, you know, like don't, well, I, I'm only speaking about myself, not about you, Owen, but I tell myself, don't take anything personally because it's actually really not personal, unless it is really personal. But maybe in my opinion, coming from the Asian culture, we take things more personally, more easily. This is my personal opinion. You don't have to agree with that. But if you, you have an easier time and you just see the positive or the, maybe the opportunities in that supposed situation where you think someone's uh, taking advantage of you, if you see it less personally see it more object objectively. And that is something that comes with just habit. Like if you practice more and more in terms of like, don't, 
Don't take things personally. See the situation as it is. Then you can see it more clearly. Do you, do you mean like uh, make, a, make a project and sell it to Netflix? Or no, r- rather like work, work for Netflix instead? Work for them, work for them is definitely a, a goal that you can work towards. I think the Asian hub, the, at least the East Asian hub of Netflix is in Singapore. But they are not making productions targeted for the Singapore market. The hub is in Singapore. The center is in Singapore. And then the Singapore office will, will um, report to the LA office and the, the regional productions will report to the Singapore office. So as in working for Netflix, not as a director though, I'm talking about. Not as a director, not as an actor, but working I'm, I'm, for Netflix as an, as an executive. Uh, that- not like that, but rather like, you know, you go into the company and then they like, because you're like one of them now in that sense. So they would like back your production. I so guess. from what I know, like Netflix don't come in too early on. They come in, they come in only after you finish your project. Most of the time they come in only after you finish your project and they license it, which means then they show it on Netflix. By then you would have finished your project already. Unless you're a super big player, then they come in very early on with you. Yeah. And then they invest in your development and production and everything else. But then, then you have you are you are one of the top in the world actually, or in that in the respective like in Japan. I think Japan Netflix, uh, I hear like caters a lot to the Japanese market because it is a big market. It's uh, over a hundred million people there, so they cater a lot to their own market there. And they are looking for a lot of Chinese language um, production that has been finished. So they are looking to license. License means that they buy it from you to distribute on their platform. Mm-hmm. Am I right, Ivona? Like, I think Ivona might have. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I think that's correct, right? From our meetings with Netflix. They they do a lot of them also do. Um, uh, like if you have a production company, you pitch to a project, and they come in. It's they just use a, a EP cost plus bottle, and they just fund the whole thing, and then you license it. But then, I don't think it'll work the same way if you're working for them because. No. Like, how are you going to um, build your project anyways? Like, if, you're uh, work, if you're working for them, you're an executive for them, which means then you're doing all this. You're actually, list, then you might be the one listening to these pitches. So if you're talking about making a film and then, this, and then uh, I, I guess showing it on Netflix, then as of today, like most, most of them do it by finishing the film and then getting some, some, some awards, the regular route, you know, like, uh, achieving some awards in the major festivals and then trying to sell it to Netflix and they might buy it. Uh, and then your film, they will have to determine if your film has a big enough market too. Mm. Which then goes back to the problem that Singapore has a very small market. Mm. So, yeah. So I would say like if you are, I, I, I get a sense that you're trying to be a filmmaker. In that, in, that, in that case, then write the best story you can and make the best project you can. Give yourself a deadline for your next project make it within three months of that deadline. Like you can, I personally think that you can finish it three months after your deadline so that you don't get too tough on yourself. But then around, you have to finish a project around your deadline and then, and then take it from there. One step, one step leads to another. But I don't think being an executive at Netflix is the answer. Okay. Netflix will probably become bigger like next year. It is, it is super big now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else? No? Okay. So can we take a picture? I know this is so low class, but I, I really need it. Because at the end of the day, my boss will say, can we write a blog post? Um, so um, uh, and, and anyone who, 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 who feels that like I don't want to be in this, yeah, it's okay, you know, not compulsory. Yeah. But uh, if you're okay, then we will just, you know, smile. All right. Okay, so I'm going to count uh, Ivana. I'm staring at your light. So can you shift your camera down a bit more? Okay, yeah, it's like a UFO, you know. <laughs> All right, okay. So everybody, um, it's very simple. All you need to do is just to smile until I tell you to stop because uh, I'm the one who is uh, screen grabbing at the moment in time. Okay, so one, two, and three, smile. Okay, hold on, just one more. Ivana is, uh, uh, hey, Ivana is, um, I, I only see your eyes. So you have to shift the camera down a bit more. Okay, just one more time. 
Well, that doesn't this, take pictures. This is like the old school photo studio. Huh? Okay, right. Okay, everybody. One, two, and three. Smile. Okay, Good. perfect. Okay, I'm going to save it. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. All right, uh, guys, again, uh, on behalf of MDIS and the School of Media and Communications, thank you so much. And I really hope to meet up with uh, friends soon. Okay. And um, yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you. And thanks to Thomas thank for you. this opportunity. Thank you everybody, reach out when you have any problems. Yes. Open. And uh, so yeah, much. so um, you can maybe look them up and add them. Whether they want to accept you as friends or not is another thing altogether. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, just feel free. Okay. Thank you, Catherine from US, and thank you, Ivana. Thank and you, thanks, Ivana. Andrew. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. How are you?